Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about calcium oxalate stones. In particular though, we are going to talk about the monohydrate type of the stone. So calcium oxalate stones are the most common type of kidney stone here in the United States. But what people don't realize is that there are actually two different types of stones. So today we're going to talk about the monohydrate variety and in another video we're going to detect or dissect the dihydrate version of that. So let's dive in and discuss the monohydrate stone. So this particular type of stone forms due to hyperoxaluria. And hyperoxaluria is a condition in which there is an elevated level of oxalate ions in your urine without a concurrent increase of calcium. Now, this, this type of stone has actually got five different subtypes that are attached to it that are going to vary in the way that the stone looks, the reason for which it forms, and they are all linked to the degree and the duration of hyperoxaluria. So what do I mean by that? So the degree is the severity of it, because as we're going to see as we go through the different stone subtypes here, there are a number of different things that will contribute to the severity or the you know, the level of hyperoxaluria that is occurring. So the level of influx of oxalate ions into the urine stream without a concurrent calcium increase. And then the duration is obviously how long hyperoxaluria is happening within your body. Now, hyperoxaluria is a curious thing because this condition can either be something that's genetic, which means that you've inherited it. It's something that is a part of your family. You just carry higher levels of oxalate in your urine. And there's also uh, idiopathic hyperoxaluria. So what does that mean? That means that it's influenced very heavily by the things that you eat, as we will see in some of these different variant stone types. Now, to kick things off, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the most prevalent of the calcium oxalate monohydrate type of stones. And this is what most people here in the US get when they get a kidney stone. So Taking a look at the little pictures I've cut out here, they're terribly ugly little things, but you know what defines the type 1A stone, so if you were to pass one of these things, what you're looking for is a more round spherical type of shape, and it's gonna be typically dark brown in color. Now I have a little asterisk over here because that's not always going to be the case because as we're gonna find out when we talk about the cause of this, um, these stones form intermittently. So there are times where they are active and then there are times where they are dormant. So if you were to pass a dark brown type 1A monohydrate stone, you would have passed that stone in its dormant phase. Now the other way that you could pass these things is they would have uh, a light grayish type of layer. It doesn't have to be completely around the entire stone, but just a light thin layer. And that would be indicative of a stone that was in an active state. So when we take a look at the internal composition of a type 1A stone, it's interesting. So if you take a look at the radius from the center here, it actually spirals out outward much in the way that a tree grows and that is indicative of that intermittent on again off again hypoxaluria state that is really characteristic of the type 1a stone so when you take a look at it it's like slicing into a tree and you can see all the little different layers uh, alternating in colors for when it was dormant when it picks up that dark brown color from the urinary pigment and then when it was active again which is a lighter gray type of layering as well so this stone almost exclusively is driven by idiopathic factors, which means they are under our influence. So there are a number of things, but most often we're looking at consumption of high oxalate foods. So things along the lines like dark chocolate, rhubarb, spinach, almonds, things of that nature. Uh, high hydroxyproline uh, foods, which are going to mess up the uh, your abilities uh, or your body's ability to metabolize oxalates appropriately and then also low calcium intake so obviously hyperoxaluria is uh, something that is a marriage between oxalates and calcium and in order to not have this issue you know a high degree of calcium is necessary but when calcium is not in relation to oxalate in your urine it's when we start to have issues now 
when we take a look over at 1B stones, these things look really pretty similar to the 1A stone with a few slight differences. So the 1B stone is much less common. However, it's going to be differentiated from the 1A stone in its shape pretty much. So it's going to be more mammillary or oval in shape. It's still going to have a rough kind of semi-budding surface. And what I mean by budding is there's just going to be these little... Uh, dots where it started to have little bits of stone growth. And then it's also going to be dark ground because uh, this one isn't as influenced by on again, off again hyperoxaluria. Um, if you were to slice this stone in half, you would not see that same radiating type of uh, or radius around the nucleus like you would have with the tree if you were to cut it open. It's incredibly unorganized and that is really due to the reason for which it forms. So these stones are a cause of moderate hyperoxaluria. So not a severe case of this, not a real low case, but it's just, you know, kind of moderate. It's always kind of there. So you're always in an imbalance between oxalate and your calcium in your urinary system. So another condition that can lead to this is stasis. So if for whatever reason you are unable to fully express your bladder on a regular basis due to some underlying medical condition, you're, you're probably gonna be forming type 1B type of stones. And then another thing that's an interesting uh, analysis when we start talking about these different subtypes of stones is the stone types can actually morph depending upon what's happening in your body. So Type 1B stones can sometimes be calcium oxalate dihydride or COD stones that actually make the transition over to a monohydrate type of stone based on, again, what's occurring in your system. So let's move on to type 1C stones. So a type 1C stone is a very, very rare stone type. Um, you're going to see kind of a pale yellow color. It's locally budding, so it's smooth in most places. And then you're just going to see little bits of buds um, that kind of poke out in all different places. So it's a very distinguishable type of stone. Internally, it has a, a loose and unorganized type of structure. And that's really truly because this again is another one of those stones that's not on again, off again, like a type 1A stone. This is due to a really severe actually condition called primary hyper, uh, hyperoxaluria. So in primary hyperoxaluria, this is something that is inherited at birth. And it actually messes with your liver's ability to generate an enzyme that helps regulate oxalate uh, metabolism within our body. So people who have this condition are typically going to be forming type 1C type of stones. And again, there's not much that you can do about this because it's with you from birth. So uh, thank your family members, unfortunately, but it is an inherited type of stone. And if you form this type, contrary to popular advice where people say it's just a calcium oxalate stone, reduce calcium, I'm sorry, reduce oxalate intake, increase calcium, and drink more water. This is really, really tough. Drinking more water will definitely help slow this process down, but since you are genetically predisposed to it, there, there's gonna have to be other things that you're gonna need to do. Primarily with this type of stone is messing with urine supersaturation. And what that means is it's messing with the balance between oxalate and calcium so that it inhibits its binding together to form kidney stones. Now, and we take a look at the next stone type, which is type 1D. Uh, these are also relatively rare, and uh, they actually form in numbers. Uh, it's a little bit like a, a river rock, actually. A lot of times they're confused with gallstones, which also uh, form in numbers. And the smooth nature of their surface, just like with river rocks, is they're rubbing against each other, forming this really smooth surface. But the difference is, you know, typically with a gallstone, the gallstone is going to be more of this pale type of yellow color from all the bile, whereas this stone here is beige and kind of pale brown. There is a discernible difference to them, but there is a, a little bit of a misconception out on the internet when you see pictures of kidney stones and you see smooth ones like this, they're more often than not going to be a gallstone, but if you see it kind of pale brown in color, that is going to be a type 1D kidney stone. So in addition to being smooth, pale, uh, you know, beige slash pale brown, uh, internally, uh, they actually kind of, if you were to slice it, it's thin concentric layers without radiations or radiating rings. And that's primarily due to, to the way that it forms. So 
the causes of these type of stones is either hydronephrosis, which is you have a backup of urine for one reason or another inside of your kidneys, and these stones like to form in the little pockets or calyxes of your kidneys, and then they rub together and they stay there and they form into larger stones. And then the other piece of it, just like we absorbed in the type 1B stone, is stasis. If you're unable to evacuate your bladder fully, uh, there's a high likelihood that you are going to form this type of stone. Now, lastly, moving on to the type 1E stone. So these are also pretty rare, and they are going to be more rough looking on the outside. Lots of local budding all over the place, um, kind of pale in color, uh, kind of like a light urine color, if you will. Um, and they're just very, very distinguishable from the rest of these type of groups. They are often confused with uh, uh, the calcium oxalate dihydrate type of stone, as we'll see in the, another video. But this is its very own distinct type of stone. So when slicing it open, we find that it's poorly organized with some layers, uh, unlike the type 1D stone. And that is really kind of because it is resulting from hyperoxaluria that is influenced by an underlying intestinal type of dysfunction. So a few examples of what that might be. So if you have uh, irritable bowel syndrome, um, if you have kidney stones, it's very likely that you have a type 1E type of stone. If you have ever had a allele resection uh, because you had Crohn's disease, which means they've removed a small section of your lower intestine because there was uh, some diseased tissue that was there. Uh, there are a number of things uh, in addition to those, but those are kind of the big two things. Um, Additionally, uh, there's just some things that came to mind. If you ever had a bariatric surgery and dealing with kidney stones, it's very likely that this is the type of stone. And then there's also some research that's been done recently linking type 2 diabetes um, to this type of kidney stone as well. So if you're diabetic or have type 2 diabetes and you're forming kidney stones, they're likely going to look like this because there is some sort of a metabolic pathway that it, uh, interacts with Alx, uh, oxalate metabolism, and then also your functioning and processing of carbohydrates and glucose. So they're thinking that there is a link because, again, in a very high degree correlation of kidney stone formers who are type 2 diabetics, this is the type of stone that they are seeing. So that's all that I have for you guys today. Please stay tuned to some future videos. We're actually going to be going through all of the major kidney stone types and breaking them apart by all the different subtypes that exist because there is an incredibly, uh, there's an incredible depth to all the different types of kidney stones that people form. And we're going to be talking about each one of those different types of stones, understanding what they look like and also why they form. So if you're curious to skip ahead on anything like this, feel free to check out our website. We have all this information already posted up there by Kidney Stone Type. It's a great resource to check out. Head to stone-relief.com and then under our education section, you can find uh, much more in-depth information on all these kidney stone types. But nevertheless, thank you so much for stopping by and we'll see you again in the next video. Thanks guys.